you very much indeed for that kind introduction, Dimitris, and <clears throat> I'm delighted to be back uh, speaking to the Jean Monnet Centre of Excellence uh, in Manchester, although shame I can't be with you in Manchester, but never mind, technology enables us to take part anyway. So thank you. Today I'd like to talk about the developing landscape of EU-China relations, and it is developing, it is developing almost by the day, but I, I'd like also to situate the relationship and to offer some sort of structure for how we can better understand where the relationship has evolved from, the implications of the tensions that clearly exist within the relationship, but also to examine how the EU as an international actor copes with its relations with a power such as China and how this coping takes account of the complexities of how the EU operates as an international actor. And of course, one of its key features is a normative power. But I think that one of the most interesting evolutions over recent years is how China is now arguably stepping up itself to be a normative power with its own views, values, approaches, models, and confidence to be able to put those forward into the international space. So that's something which I've captured in this idea of discourse power, which moves beyond just this idea of political and economic power that are the conventional platforms of many aspects of international relations. So I'd certainly like to be able to touch on that because I think it's a significant point for now, but also into the future as we try and evaluate potential scenarios looking forward. And <clears throat> I will offer at the end a, a, a very straightforward and, and simple structure to try and perhaps locate some of the key areas of tension, but also looking at some areas where there are still cooperation, areas of optimism, but where in fact pessimism also raises its head too. So a few things to, to think about as we step forward. First of all, then, let's just try and locate EU-China relations in the panoply of international relations more generally. I, I, uh, I know that in, in, in the lexicon of the European Union, there are various words, including pillars in the past and uh, competences and things of that kind. I, I prefer the idea of engagement domains as a phrase because it, it almost allows there to be a, a merging between two or more domains, a bit like a collection of Venn diagrams. So you, you have the traditional trade and investment relationship, uh, which is long standing and is very important. You then also have domains that overlap with global governance and the institutions at the international level. Uh, and China's view of the evolution of this global governance arrangement. And of course, the European Union's focus on what it sees as effective multilateralism, the way in which as a norm, we should be solving our problems at the international level. But then in addition to that, there are other areas where the two powers have come together. And indeed, uh, beneath the radar of the more high visibility areas of tension, technical assistance has been quite successful over the past few years, in particular areas that I've studied, such as intellectual property, legal development uh, has been part of joint initiatives funded both by the EU and various ministries in China to empower Chinese judges to understand better the implications of decision making in, uh, in intellectual property courts. And um, th those, are, those are areas which are below the radar of some of the key areas of tension. And yet also um, we have to take into account the politics and society issues where there have been far less successful behind the border initiatives and indeed where perhaps the normative collision is at its most sharp. But beyond these domains of engagement, there are also institution engagement. And it, it's important to understand that the EU is an international actor and since 2011 has had special status at the United Nations, has been an active participant in various ASEAN-led uh, um, institutional engagements, but also, of course, takes a place in uh, various organizational structures such as the G20, uh, a key player in the World Trade Organization, 
and also uh, a key actor within the G20 summits. Now, one particular uh, example that is absent there um, is the East Asia Summit. And it's often seen as being a, an understandable absence because the East Asia Summit is perhaps seen more as a, a security domain, uh, which the EU has traditionally not had. It will, I think, be extremely interesting to see whether negotiations to join the East Asia Summit come to fruition. They've been on and off for years and years and years, and there have been various inhibitors one way or another on, on multiple sides as to whether the EU should join. Um, but as security, in particular security within both Asia Pacific and interconnected through the Russia-China relationship into the European domain becomes more key. And as strategic autonomy within the EU becomes something more significant beyond traditional domains of politics and economics, we may see the EU starting to become a more active uh, security actor. And it may well be appropriate for the EU to take a more active role in the EAS in the years to come. <clears throat> One thing I ask as part of my research to myself, as well as to others, uh, that I discuss my ideas with is, well, what kind of foreign policy actor does the EU want to be? How does it want to be seen? It is a very special kind of institution. It's more than just an intergovernmental collection of, uh, of contracting parties. There are treaties which encapsulate not just relationships between supranational organizations and member states, but an active pooling of sovereignty amongst those member states, hence the idea of competences at different levels. So this foreign policy actor is a very distinctive engine of action internationally. And I would say that there's been a debate within the elites of the EU and within those of us amongst the scholarly community who follow how the EU is evolving between two fundamentally different aspects of engagement in foreign policy. The normative power that was perhaps first and most uh, clearly encapsulated by Romani Prodi's almost evangelical call in his speech to the European Parliament in 2000, where he talked about the opportunity for the new century, for the European ideals to be pushed into the international space. So perfect capturing of what a normative power is perhaps all about. But then there are also competing economic interests that the European Union has as the key negotiator for both trade and investment policy on behalf of the member states. And sometimes there are these difficult compromises that need to be made between values that you may have to project and want to internalize elsewhere, but also economic deals that, that need to be made. But traditionally, there have been complexities within the EU as well, within divisions across, particularly the Parliament on one side and the Commission and Council on the other, in the relationships that these issues have, in particular with countries like China, where the Parliament has taken traditionally a much more overt focus on values and positions and uh, the importance of human rights. One of the reasons why the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the uh, uh, partnership and cooperation agreement initiated in 2007 has not gone anywhere is because of these kinds of, of difficulties. Why we are still dealing with dozens and dozens of different separate dialogues at different levels, rather than an overarching construction of a, a, a political coordinated relationship. Um, so these, these have been long-standing difficulties within the institutions of Brussels, but those divisions are also reflected within the uh, relationships across the member states as well. Um, and this isn't just about the division between East and West. There are differences in viewpoint between Budapest and Prague and Vilnius in the East, and some areas of difference in relationships to China uh, between parts of, of Western uh, po policies too. So you have this complexity, which does inevitably inhibit the way that the EU can be seen and has acted in foreign policy terms about China. And I think unity over Ukraine, which has been remarkable and swift in its arrival, still does not necessarily mean that the underlying tensions of these divisions 
have gone away in their relationship with China. And I think we see the re-election of Orban and the position uh, that he has robustly adopted in his relationship, not just with Russia, uh, but with China in particular, and the importance of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, to uh, Hungary into the future as something to consider. Exploring a little bit more, this journey over the last 20 years that the EU-China relationship has had began with a great deal of optimism, uh, not just optimism on the EU side, uh, premised by uh, Romano Prodi's ideas about values projection and uh, normative outreach, but also from the China side. So for different reasons, the early part of the 21st century was really one of optimism that a comprehensive strategic partnership would be valuable to both sides. Now, these differences were that on the EU side, I think that there was a very genuine hope and almost an expectation that through engagement, through dialogue and through trade, there would be some sort of transformation, both politically and economically, of the Chinese party state structure, even if it didn't become exactly like the EU, it would be on a journey and that the reform and opening journey would evolve in some semblance that would make China uh, a, a, uh, a reliable and, and strong partner within a neoliberal economic family. On the Chinese side, they have always been looking for major global powers to share poles of power uh, against what they see as the hegemony of the United States and where in positional terms, they still see a genuine strategy of containment has been the objective of the United States in the Asia Pacific. Even the phrase Indo-Pacific is seen by many Chinese elites has been a target to challenge uh, the Chinese position uh, within the Asia Pacific region. Now, over time, there were a number of issues and problems, which I, I will touch upon in a moment, that have inhibited and reduced that level of optimism on both sides. The EU has not necessarily taken on a distinctive pole of power role. Inevitably, uh, there were a lot of concerns about the whole issue of multipolarity anyway, because the EU believes in effective multilateralism, not multipolarity. But also on the Chinese side, there were concerns uh, about the extent to which America remains an elephant in the room. There are also concerns on the EU side about the direction of uh, China's reform journey. And this led to the much more overtly hostile strategic outlook document published just before the pandemic in 2019, where China was talked about as a systemic rival and an economic competitor, as two of the most important phrases that uh, spring to mind from that document. And then, of course, we have the 2021 Global Gateway Initiative, which is effectively a direct call to arms in order to challenge the Belt and Road Initiative uh, that is seen as having uh, a, a direct effect on relations between some parts of the Eastern European bloc and, and China. And this is interesting because it, it reinforces norms. If you look at the way in which it has been linked to creating links, not dependencies, and to furthering the norms and values of the EU, norms are back in the forefront of international politics. Uh, and I think those normative differences are being sharpened by the differences in the direction of uh, the um, uh, Chinese uh, economic as well as political development. Now, speaking of economics, it, they, those ties remain very significant. 1.9 billion euros a day, nearly 700 billion euros a year of goods trade, still very significant, and yet has also significant feature has been the deficit in China's favor, which is helping to fuel ongoing reciprocity tensions in this relationship about access, about, uh, uh, about equality of, 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 uh, of access and, uh, and level playing field of regulatory uh, burdens. But equally, the European Union, like many advanced economies, is fundamentally also a services-led economy as well. And trade and services is, is still tumbling along at around about 10% of the trade in goods. And this is, again, one of the key areas where 
the European Union would like to unlock China in some ways and that there have been difficulties and inhibitors to do that. But investment has almost, at least in the recent past, eclipsed the tensions of trade, which have been ongoing for some time, because investment has become a priority area for China as well. It is now a significant outward investor. And apart from some very welcome market seeking investment. One of the areas where China has been active is in technology seeking investment in advanced economies in America, in Britain and in the European Union. And this technology seeking investment has led to certain concerns about how technology know how and technology products and technology companies, especially in the vertically integrated economies such as Germany, where the Mittelstadt firms were explicitly targeted by China's Made in 2025 uh, initiative. Um, they led to a sharp spike around about 2015, 2016 in the extent of investment from China into Europe. And that led to a number of negative responses, which have evolved into a number of monitoring and, um, uh, and regulatory initiatives to control investment. Whilst China is not necessarily explicitly mentioned in legislation, uh, the message underlying these concerns is that the creation of relationships and foreign direct investment targeting needs to be considered in the whole, and it needs to be considered as to where that technology is going, what use of that technology is going to be made, and how that technology could end up being used in a competitive way against the, the host country. So these are things now that have been wrapped up into legislative initiatives. One area where there was a lot of optimism about the opportunities to build the bedrock of more institutional relationship was with the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. And although that there are lots of debates about whether that was a good deal or a bad deal, or whether it was a deal slewed in China's favor or the EU's favor, what really matters is that it's not going anywhere at the moment because of the developments that occurred last year over sanctions that were imposed by China on MEPs and other EU actors. So we have an inhibitor, even in areas where there was at least some feeling that we could be rebuilding uh, a structure and the relationship. Now, China has its own perspectives on the EU, and the, those are not wholly negative. Um, there are positive perspectives about how the EU is able to integrate member states of different economic levels when they first join. And that's important for China because of its own objectives to bring greater uh, coordination of development. And indeed, the common prosperity agenda is focused upon that. Equally, at least traditionally, there's never been seen as a strategic rivalry that there is with the United States. Uh, now, whether this will actually change, uh, given the developments into the future, that's, that's an argument um, that we, we need to evaluate and consider, but there needs to be further evidence before we can really come to some sort of conclusion on that. But certainly that's never been seen as quite the sharp um, uh, dynamic that has existed in the US-China relationship. Nevertheless, there are these negatives that are persisting, and they've been ongoing for many, many years. This idea of EU's political rights versus China's economic rights, which are now very sharpened in China's much more activist focus within the e, uh, United Nations um, Human Rights Council, where it's much more confident about coalition building, about projecting its own position about what are legitimate human rights and the developmental elements of human rights beyond just the politics uh, that, that, that China puts forward. Uh, that the EU uh, is seen as putting forward. And then in the end, there is this inherent disappointment that the EU is not stepping up as a pole of power. Well, interestingly, clearly, that has um, potentially been reshaped uh, by the way in which uh, strategic autonomy is now becoming uh, an issue of consideration across the EU. But nevertheless, the relationship across the Atlantic is still a very, very strong one and cannot be ignored in any way. So the idea that the EU would be some sort of ballast against hegemonism from the United States is, is perhaps one that was not well placed in the first place. Very briefly, I just want to touch on a few case studies where we can put this into some context. Trade, market economy, um, the direction of China's economic reforms, research and innovation, and the 
discourse power of China. And my overall argument here is I think that there is a growing trust deficit, which is now a singular part of the relationship. And that to some extent that has replaced the values gap that was often seen as being the biggest inhibitor to a close relationship. But the thing is you can bridge a gap and you can make inroads to make sure that you rebuild, you build ways of talking to each other. Has the trust deficit actually meant that it's now much harder to make a positive and optimistic relationship for the future? Well, trade is an example where things, despite the incredible numbers, have not been well and are not going well and continue not to be going well. Unfairnesses persist across China's engagement in the international trade sphere, according to the EU's viewpoint on this, that there is bad faith even now against commitments made 20 years ago, that technical barriers to trade remain and that subsidies are a major problem and that China is inhibiting the inclusion of proper subsidies at the full level that is necessary within WTO trade reform negotiations. So that is not going well. China's view, however, is completely upended on the basis that they see that their ongoing refusal to recognize China as a market economy after 40 years of reform and opening is simply a deep lack of respect. It is pushing against the strategic partnership. And it was captured perfectly in one interview I had with a senior Chinese diplomat who said, it's like slapping your face and then saying, let's be partners. So that their view is that this is a, a rule setting excuse for protectionism across the EU against China's legitimate competition. So it's very hard to bridge these gaps, despite the fact that trade continues there are clearly major initiative problems to move towards a free trade agreement. But part of the underlying problem and an incredibly important element, I think, of this movement towards this systemic rivalry idea is this idea of China's reform journey having taken a different turn. Despite the decision and the rhetoric that was announced in 2013 and afterwards by the Chinese party state, the viewpoint is now increasingly that reform towards a neoliberal framework with a light touch party state system, a market driven uh, collective, is not something that is the direction that the Chinese leadership wish to take the country's economy, that the party state's role has grown, the role of state-owned and state-preferred enterprises has become more, not less significant, and that this poses real genuine challenges because no longer is there a level of confidence within the Brussels elite that all of the work to build links and to help the journey towards economic reform and opening is, is actually shifting. And, and that we, we can see in, in Xi Jinping's rhetoric about how there is now this new contradiction that we are moving beyond Deng's uh, focus on just getting, getting rich and being uh, economically successful towards some different kind of framework, a different kind of structure, a different set of economic relations where the party state is still a major, major player uh, in decision making and uh, economic acting. And, and that this is captioned most by phrases I've heard, which is this idea of promise fatigue uh, that has been heard uh, in and around the corridors of Brussels. Research and innovation continues to be an area of potential gain by, for both sides because they share interest in a number of aspects of those areas where both sides have skills. Smart cities, sustainable urbanization, they're both faced with these problems. And also, of course, the injection of the, the climate crisis and the way in which it is in both economies' interests to try and arrange things such that the climate system is, is, is resolved. Well, these are areas of gain and areas of collaboration and cooperation. There are inhibitors. Intellectual property is not where uh, the, uh, the, the Europeans might want it to be. But nevertheless, is it a lot better than it was a few years ago? However, um, I, I would say that the, one of the biggest problems here is that when we had a debate at the EU-China summit a few years ago on economics and market recognition, 
the very genuine unity over research, innovation, climate was not sufficient to bridge the other gaps. And that particular summit did not issue a, a joint communique because of the differences of view. So we shouldn't think that just having shared interest is going to be enough to overcome the differences. And finally, this idea of discourse power, which I think is a growing, it's a relatively new area to view within China's uh, international relations, but I think it's a growing area of significance because within trade terms, there are clearly preferences China has about at the border tariff agreements such as RCEP versus deep behind the border harmonization and transformations that I don't think are, are in accordance with China's interests or, or wishes. As we've already touched on in human rights, we have this idea of a, a counter narrative, a counter discourse, not just simply defending China's position on various things, but pushing forward a different kind of narrative that argues that, well, frankly, without development, without society, stability and structure, there can't be any long term political rights because they don't have any meaning. And that equally, that there are inherent problems in the way in which Western democracies handle their own minorities, handle their own political differences uh, that are less effective at dealing with certain kinds of problems that face the people than the way in which China deals with them. And this is most apparent in the much more proactive mm -hmm. assertiveness that we see in the Human Rights Council, but clearly are reflected also in the um, bilateral EU-China human rights dialogues, which are ongoing, but which really haven't produced very much of uh, interest to, to Europeans. And then the economic model. And we've often said in the past that there was no real definition of what was the China model and that there wasn't this idea of exporting a model as, as a structural framework like a Washington consensus. And that whilst that may still be true, I think that if you look at Xi Jinping's speeches and you look at the way in which China is clearly developing in a framework which would not have been perhaps where we would see that direction if we were looking 10 years ago under Wen Jiabao, then I think we are seeing a different kind of economic actor with a different kind of structural model for a different role of the party state apparatus. And this is where I believe we also have a challenge that the European elites are coming to grips with. So finally, I offer this structural framework. It's a very simple, it's simply a spectrum upon which you can then map and model any number of policy overlaps. And what I think is, is useful and helpful is over time, I've been looking at how in my view, these things have shifted. And whilst there are elements of stability, the EU's incoherence and inability to speak with one voice to China has largely not made a great deal of progress. But there have been other differences. The reform journey has now much more moved towards the side of the tension and the pessimists about that reform journey are much sharper and, and much uh, more uh, widely spoken than the optimists were a few years ago. Research and innovation, which was often seen as an area of significant progress and great optimism, it's still an area of potential, but it's starting to shift. And I think that that is a, an interesting area. Foreign direct investment, again, when it was first initiated from China into the EU, was largely market seeking, was seen as something of great progress and was viewed with great optimism and opportunity. That is now moving inexorably towards an area of both limited progress and, and more overt pessimism. Uh, and then trade, which has been this ongoing dichotomy between the great success of the numbers, but also the ongoing tensions of the issues. That remains. But capturing them all is this issue of discourse, this issue of the emergence of potentially normative power that is China challenging directly the norms of, of the European Union in, in uh, in the world and, and arguably even in its own backyard of candidate countries. So in conclusion, the EU-China relations are very important to both parties. They're not the most important relationship for either party, which means they're always going to be managed within a spectrum of other issues that take priority. But that it is an ongoing journey. And my argument is that perhaps we are now faced 
with the reality that a values gap has morphed into a trust deficit, which is much harder to resolve going forward. But the destination of the relationship is still unclear. And as I said right at the beginning, changes almost by the week. Thank you.